The playing of drums is a sign of the close of probation? Where do people get this idea from? Well, I believe that people are getting this idea from a misquote or the misuse and abuse of Ellen G. White's writings. I went through YouTube and I found another video with regards to music and drums in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I found another ministry calling out the church and calling out apostasy all over the internet web for everyone to find, even non-Adventists. And so, is this really the case? Is the drums and the use of drums in the Seventh-day Adventist Church a sign of the close of probation? This is what we're going to examine. Now, there's a video by Messengers of Present Truth Ministry, and Devaney, he is sharing about drums in the church briefly, mind you. And I've collected these clips just from his video and to share with you and to show you the idea and the misuse and abuse of this important Ellen G. White quote. Here in this video, we are going to delve into this quotation and the Bible to show the truth regards, with regards to drums the use of them in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You can't afford to miss this video. Before I get into this clip, I want to remind you, if you like this analysis and you like this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Check out this clip and let me know what you think. We don't have much time. I want to pause and pray. Let me just share one more thing and then I'm going to pause and pray. One more thing. The prophet identifies one event that must take place inside the church that indicates to us that human probation is about to close. Shaking, that is true. That precedes the Sunday law. That is very true. And today we are in the shaking. Thank you, Brother Sharif. Select and Messages, book 2, page 36. She says, the things you described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me will take place just before the close of probation. Every uncool thing will be demonstrated. They will be shouting, dancing drums. She says, uh, senses of rational beings will become so confused that we, they could not be trusted to make right decisions. And then she says, all this is closed as the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit never reveals himself in such a bedlam of noise. Question, are we nearing the test? Yes. What sign in the church are we seeing? that we are probations about to close. Drums are being brought into the church. But the issue of finances, yes. we've been told to lift burdens on the Sabbath, right? So on the issue of keeping the Sabbath, the Sabbath is something that the church is keeping the Sabbath, and they choose to cook on the Sabbath to go do feeding. Can that be considered fanaticism? Where we've been indicated, we've been guided to keep the Sabbath. Holy, yes. If, now, yeah. Why not cook it on a Friday? Yeah, if you know, if I know for sure yes. I'm going to feed the hungry on Sabbath, yes. why not cook it the Friday? Now, 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 brother, I, I'm going to close that as fanaticism because you're going beyond what God has said. Yes, if you know for sure I'm going to feed someone on Sabbath, why not do it the day before? Now, all the cases we might be caught of God, where somebody's entire hunger, entire family, we, there's times you'll be caught off God, you do not see this coming, then you're going to have to provide for them. And she says, not to, re, to, to, to in desire for ages, not to release relief suffering on the Sabbath. If you have the opportunity to do so, God will hold you guilty for violating the Sabbath. So if there's suffering and you have the ability to help, she says, God will hold you guilty. She says, He doesn't want one of His creatures to suffer during the Sabbath. But I'm not going to intentionally now say, you know what, uh, I'm waiting for the Sabbath to cook. No, then you are a violator of the law. You are breaking the commandments of God. Yes, 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 sister. Now, 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 now back to my point. So the image of the peace has been formed, which the prophet says in Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 976, must be formed just before probation closes. We see it. Inside the church, we see drums, which he says must be brought in just before the close of probation. Wow. So he gets into the fact that drums are a sign of the close of probation and that drums shouldn't be used in the Seventh-day Adventist church is the main thrust and point. And so I've shared with you this clip to reveal to you that there are some individuals who sincerely believe this. And we need to clarify this point. It's very important that we don't become critical and overbearing all because of the use of drums in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now let's look at the quotation from Ellen G. White and see what she had to say. Here it says, 
It is impossible to estimate too largely the work that the Lord will accomplish through his proposed vessels in carrying out his mind and purpose. She writes in the quote, The things you have described as taking place in Indiana will take place just before the close of probation. So don't, don't forget this. That at the close of human probation, near the close of human probation, there will be a repeat of what was happening in Indiana at the time. Now what was going on? She continues, There would be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. The senses would be confused. So hold up. Is Ellen G. White bashing drums and is she bashing, well, music and dancing? What's really the key focus here in this text? Well, it continues. She writes, The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. You see, this whole bedlam of noise, it's an invention of Satan. The issue was the bedlam of noise, not the music instrument. Take a look and read just a little bit further and you'll get the point. She writes, A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which, if conducted aright, might be a blessing. So hold on a second. Drums, if used aright, could be a blessing? So back in Indiana, the drums were being misused. You see, that's the point. Drums are not the problem. It is the mu misuse of them which is the problem. Now. Let's say you're saying, well, Ben, you're putting your own spin on this. Is there anyone else? Is there another witness? Can I get another witness? Yes, we can. We can go back to the writings of Stephen Haskell, who was alive at the time and was reporting about the same fact, the same things that were going on in Indiana. Here is writes here to describe it. I hardly know what to say. It is beyond all description. Stephen Haskell writes. He goes, there was these ministers in these meetings happening in Indiana, and they were associated with the cleansing message or the holy flesh movement. Now, there was a lot of apostasy, a lot of heresy being taught here. I should say a lot of heresy being taught, but my point in this video is not to get into that. I want to get into worship, music, and drums. So let's move on to the next here. He writes, they have an organ, one bass viol, three fiddles, two flutes, three tambourines, three horns, and a big bass drum, and perhaps other instruments which I have not mentioned. They get on a high key, you cannot hear a word from the congregation in their singing, nor hear anything unless it be shrieks of those who are half insane. So notice that he is listing a bunch of musical instruments which were not being played in accordance with God's will, creating a bedlam of noise that shocked the senses. You see, the issue wasn't the drums. The issue was all these different instruments being played in a wrong fashion. The music, the instruments were being played, they were not being conducted aright, and was proved not to be a blessing, but a curse to the people, bringing in, well, supporting damnable heresy by the holy flesh movement and so on. So was drums really the issue? Clearly not. It was the way the music was played. Now, so some of us are against drums in church. And I understand, they're loud, they're associated with rock music, they're associated often with the wrong crowd, even with heathen idolatrous worship. But did you know that drums were associated with the worship of the one true God? Get ready for your mind to be blown. Take a look at this. The tabret is a kind of drum. It was used for praise, celebrations, prophesying, religious services, and worship. Now, I'm going to delve a little bit into Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 4. Chapter 31 talks about how the worship and the social life of the Israelites was to be restored. After the captivity, they were to be brought back and they were going to restore the temple and basically restore the, the society. And in that restoration, Israel is likened to one who's adorned with tabrets signifying that in the restoration of true worship of God and in the um, institution of the temple, the upbuilding of the temple again, there would be tabrets associated with the worship and the social life, decked with tabrets. Be in a bountiful supply and bountiful use. Now, let's continue. Have you ever seen an ancient tabret before? There's a prior video I did with regards to Andrew Enriquez and with regards to uh, Randy Skeet, which actually I neglected to share with you a picture of a tabret and what it looks like. So I'm going to share it with you right now. As you can see on the screen, you'll see a different versions of the tabret. Now, notice the tabret looked a lot like a tambourine, but it also had this skin or this membrane uh, attached to it in which the, the drum would be struck. So it was a percussion instrument. It wasn't just a simple tambourine like we see today. It would have had a membrane on it which stretched, which would have been struck. And so, believe me and believe the Bible that it is true. Drums were used in the worship of Jehovah. Praise the Lord. Drums are not evil. 
It's how we play them that matters. Now, let's go a little bit further in the Bible. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 29, verse 25. It says, And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, another percussion instrument. And notice that this, these cymbals were instituted and brought in at the commandment of David, Gad the king's here, Nathan the prophet, and by the prophets, by the commandment of the Lord. So in the setup of the worship of God, cymbals were brought in, a percussion instrument, a percussion instrument. Don't forget that. And it was brought into the house of the Lord. Well, what happened in the house of the Lord? We look to Jeremiah chapter 26 and verse 2, and we see that worship happened in the Lord's house. So drums were used in the Lord's worship. Cymbals were used. Uh, tabrets were used. It's clear. Drums are not the problem. What it is is how we use them. And the next picture you can see here that the Egyptian musical instruments of the cymbals. The Egyptians used cymbals as did, obviously, the people of God. And you see that they're tethered by a string, so they'd be stuck together and you could clash them together. And we have cymbals today on the modern drum kits of today. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 to 21, we read about Cain and his lineage. And out from this wicked Cain, who slew, killed his brother, who was the first, uh, basically, murderer here, out of his lineage comes Jubal. And Jubal, he was the father of all such that handled the harp and the organ. So, hold on a second. Egyptians used cymbals. Egyptians used the harp. Cain... That wicked one also had handled the harp and the organ, and, and he had uh, basically let out in this. So hold on a second, though. So all of a sudden, because Egyptians used the harp and the cymbals, all because of Cain and his wicked lineage were very skilled at using the harp and the organ, does that all of a sudden mean that we put away the harp and the organ? No, of course not. It all matters on how we play it. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that clear? So we don't have to be anxious and critical when we walk into a church that has drums. But of course, we should be worried when they're played in an incorrect fashion, in the wrong way. And there is a case of when God's people had played music inappropriately. We go to the Exodus experience in Exodus chapter 32. We read about how the Hebrew people were shouting and dancing. And then basically Joshua had heard the noise of the people and he said to Moses, Well, I hear a noise of war in the camp. And then Moses clarifies, he goes, no, this is the noise of them that sing, but it sounded like war. Now, have you ever been to a metal concert or a rock concert? I hope you haven't, but if you've heard it before, it sounds like the noise of war. And, and around during this time of noise of war and all this loud music and boisterous music, they saw the calf and the dancing. So what was the issue? It's not the issue of playing the instruments, it's how they are played. It's not the instrument themselves, it's how the instruments are used. And in the case of idolatrous worship, it always, has, it always has been associated with a bedlam of noise, the wrong use. So whenever there was idolatry, there was always a bedlam of noise. Basically a nasty, uh, you know, you could say like a, a rock concert or a metal concert of, of their time. A bedlam of noise that would shock the senses and would just create this crazy excitement that would drive people into the false worship of some idol. This is not what we should do. We should conduct our music properly. Which leads me into my next uh, quotations from the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 5, we're told that we should speak to ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our heart to the Lord, giving thanks always. As a matter of fact, I don't see here any prohibition of any instrument. I see an music that should be played aright. We can, we can sing spiritual songs, which would remind me of contemporary Christian music. That, of course, it does not sound like a bedlam of noise. Hymns, psalms, and we're supposed to let the words of Christ dwell in us richly in these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So the music should be inspired on the word of God and should quote the word of God frequently and teach us things. Because all of this music is to be done to the glory of God. If it doesn't glorify God, then there's a problem. If it glorifies man or glorifies the praise team, nuh uh, we should be glorifying God. God should be glorified in our music. It shouldn't be self. There should be no self. There should be all Jesus in our worship music. And it all should be done decently in order, not a bedlam of noise that shocks the senses. That goes against decently in order. And music is so important because when music is rightly conducted and quotes from the Bible, it is instructional and helps us memorize things. If we look at Ellen G. White's writings on councils of voice, speech, and song, we see that the people were directed to commit to memory poetic history and to teach it to their children and children's children. 
It was chanted by the congregation when they assembled for worship, and to be repeated by the people as they went about their daily labors. You see, the great leader embodied truths in music, and this music helped people remember truth. It says here, as the people journey through the wilderness, many precious lessons were fixed in their minds by means of song. You see, music is supposed to be instructional and helps us to memorize salvific truth, salvific instruction. Music is so important for our sanctification and for our Christian growth. That's why music needs to be conducted right. And the problem ain't the drums, it's how they're used. So here's a summary on music. Worship music. Melody should be the priority. There should be solemn, cheerful melodies suited to the occasion. Spiritual lyrics inspired by the Bible. Words to be clear and distinct, with no offensive language or gestures by the praise team. There should be beauty, pathos, and power. It should be conducted with solemnity and awe, and provide salvific instruction needed for people to be saved. You see, my friend, we have to be so careful about we listen, what we listen to on YouTube. We have to test everything. We have to analyze everything. And we have to be critical. We have to critically evaluate things in the love of Christ. And so I got no problem with drums in the church as long as they're used according to God's will in a solemn, graceful, and respectful manner. And that goes not just for drums, but for every instrument. And that type of thing also applies to our, our musicians, our, our singers, I mean. Our singers should sing gracefully and, with, and with, with reverence and respect for God. Never in a shouting bedlam of noise, which excites the senses. No, never. And so I hope I've made this text clear. I've made the Ellen G. White quotation clear. That you may know that this is the right interpretation. And that you don't have to worry or be upset when you see drums in the church. And think, oh no, the close of probation. And, oh, you know, and, and start you know, basically criticizing the church. God loves his church, and enfeebled as defective as it may appear, it, has, it holds his supreme regard. Yeah, the church makes mistakes. Yes, people. People make mistakes, because the church is not a building, it's people. And people coming together make up what's called the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which adhere to 28 fundamental beliefs. And so we, the people of God, that worship God in spirit and truth, and hold these fundamental beliefs, we want to make sure our music is conducted right and that we do all to the glory of God. Let us not lose sight of Jesus. Let us not be carried away with every wind of doctrine, but let us be solid, grounded, united in God's church. Thank you for joining me. And don't forget, if you like this video, like, subscribe, and share, and let me know what you think in the comment section down below. God bless you.